This is John Kola with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you coming at you in my backyard garden. And we're doing a whiteboard in the garden. This is the first time I'm doing a whiteboard in the garden. I like it a lot more than doing it inside. The lighting's better. And in uh, any case, uh, today's episode is about maximizing your diet's benefits. Whether you guys are on a raw vegan diet, a vegan diet, a plant-based diet, a keto diet, an omnivorous diet, I don't care what kind of diet you guys are on, I want to share the three factors besides the diet that you choose to eat that will influence how much success and how much benefit you get from your specific diet. Because diet is only one of the major four components that I want you guys to have awareness about. And, you know, usually all the emphasis is put on just the diet that your guys are eating. You know, the keto diet's healthier than the vegan diet, which is healthier than the whole food plant-based diet, and on and on and on. What I will tell you guys is that my personal opinion on what diet is the best to eat is I recommend a whole food plant-based diet that is mostly raw. And I said, you know, whole food plant-based. I didn't say exclusively plants. I know some vegans might get mad at me for saying that. You know, but the science is clear that if you guys want to include some animal-based products in your diet, if you keep it down to 5% or less of your calories, and you eat a whole food plant-based diet, otherwise, using my techniques, man, you guys could be super healthy, maybe even healthier than some 100% vegans that are deficient in things because they're really not paying attention. My personal opinion, of course. You should not exceed 10% of your calories from animal-based foods. Otherwise, then you're probably overeating animal products and you're not eating enough plant foods to offset for the animal products. That's all I'm going to talk about that. Me, personally, I eat a predominantly raw vegan diet with small amounts of heat processed foods to round it out. All right, so now that we got the diet out of the way, the diet is just one component in this circle that I've created. And you can see diet is one component, one square how the food is grown and is another square no matter what diet you're eating right how is a food grown whether it's animals or you know plants another one is how is the food processed not only before you buy it but after you buy it how do you process it specifically and also based on your diet what foods are you choosing i mean if you're on a vegan diet you guys could choose you know coke and ho-hos and ding-dongs those junk foods are vegan, but they're definitely not healthy. So I want you guys to choose the healthiest foods. I want you guys to be concerned about how it's grown, which I'll share with you guys my opinions on the best foods that you guys could buy, as well as the best ways of processing. Hardly any diet styles take all these into consideration. And this is something that I've learned over my now 28 years living on a raw plant-based if you want to call it vegan diet myself, because I'm, I mean, I'm literally in my garden. I, I, I know how my food is grown. I've maximized the techniques I use to grow the highest quality, most nutritious food. Because you could eat a carnivorous diet and eat nothing but factory farmed animals. And in my opinion, that's terrible, not only for the animals, but also for you. Because factory farmed animals we know is definitely not a good thing. But then again, you could say, well, there's factory farmed fruits and vegetables, John. And I know a lot of you guys are eating factory farmed fruits and vegetables. And yes, I do eat factory farmed fruits and vegetables from industrial agriculture. I try to get organic whenever possible. And more importantly, I grow as much as food as I can myself, as well as support local farms that are not, you know, literally industrial farmed produce. So this is what I really want to cover in detail in this episode to get you guys' feet wet, to create some awareness about it's more than just the diet, but it's these three other factors, in my opinion, that are quite critical for your health and success of your specific diet that you choose, all right? So let's go ahead and get into the foods that you choose on your diet. Once again, you know, the example was you could eat vegan and eat nothing but, you know, junk food vegan things. You could, you could be on a raw vegan diet and choose nothing but dates, bananas, and romaine lettuce because kale has toxins and cauliflower is not good for you and, and you can't find blueberries or blackberries or they're too expensive to buy, right? So the foods you choose are critical to your success or failure, right? I mean, 
diversity of different types of foods, whatever diet you guys are on is the critical component there. I want you guys to eat a diversity of different foods. Don't just go to the grocery store every week and buy the same six items or seven items or ten items and then just eat oatmeal every day for breakfast because that's what you automatically do. Hey, that's great because you're eating oatmeal every day, but you know, you're not eating kamut or you're not eating quinoa, you're not eating millet, you're not eating einkorn, which is, you know, ancient wheat. So you're li really limiting your diet. So I really want you guys to create a diversity uh, and, and eat different things regularly. You eat a diversity of different types of foods, right? And I want you guys to select more nutrient dense foods than others, right? What are nutrient dense? I categorize nutrient density as having a lot more of the micronutrients as compared to calories. We want to eat more calorie poor foods with higher nutrients in the foods. So for example, uh, more, what's a more nutrient dense food comparing kale to bananas, right? That's easy. Kale, kale, you could, you could barely get calories from it, has a lot more nutrients than bananas. Yes, there's a place for bananas, but yes, there's a place for kale as well. You could look up the ANDI scoring system, ANDI, Aggregate Nutrient Density Index. That's the index that I generally look at. And basically what you're gonna see there is that all leafy greens, vegetables, and then fruits, basically in that order, are some of the most nutrient dense foods on the entire planet. And you wanna eat foods with that diversity of fiber and nutrients, right? Fiber is super critical and people tend to lump fiber in one category. Oh, that food has fiber because it says it has 10 grams on the label. And so that fiber is the same as a different fiber is the same as a different fiber. Fiber is not all created equal. Different fibers, different celluloses, different pectins will feed different probiotic bacteria in our guts. And so, you know, I've learned more recently that eating a diversity of fiber and more importantly diversity of different nutrients. Don't just eat blueberries every morning. Hey, the next morning switch it up and have organic cherries and the next morning have organic red dragon fruit. The next morning have some strawberries, you know, have some acai berry powder. It's always switch it up, right? So diversify the food that you choose to eat on your specific diet, right? And then you want to have a diversity of different types of foods. So for example, hey, everybody loves the Fuji apple, but there's Granny Smith apples, there's Gala apples, you know, there's Pink Pearl apples, you know, there's Rose Glow apples, there's all different kinds of apples. So I want you guys, even just within a certain types of foods, eat a diversity as well, right? You always go and get Valencia oranges. Hey, get some navel oranges when they're in season, which is right now. More importantly, eat different kinds of citrus. Eat the Cara Cara oranges, eat the blood oranges, right? Eat the raspberry oranges. Eat the different kinds of tangerines and mandarins and pomelos and, you know, the kumquats, right? There's many different types of citrus you guys could eat. And I think it's sad when somebody just gets the same exact kind every single time. And one of the joys in life I have is going to the farmer's market and seeing all the diversity of different citrus fruits or different kinds of apples or even different kinds of avocados. You know, there's more than just the Haas. I get these edible skin avocados. There's a... Bacons, the Fortes, the Pickertons. There's like the big Florida ones that are like more watery, not buttery. All kinds. So, you know, if you guys grow your own, then you could really, you know, eat more of our diversity than you can if you have to rely on places to buy your food. Of course, one of the, my biggest tips on eating a diversity of the food is visiting an Asian market near you. If you guys have any Asian markets near you, they have a lot more diversity of especially the vegetables than standard American supermarkets. And the last tip for foods you choose is eat all parts of plants. Very important. Some people may focus on the fruit part of the plants. John, I just eat fruit because I'm a fruititarian or fruitarian, whatever you guys want to call it, right? That's great because the fruit part of plants will concentrate certain nutrients but the thing is, it doesn't have all the different nutrients from the plant. You know, for example, in celery or stem vegetables, another fruit, another veg, uh, another part of the plant I want you guys to eat are stems. Stem vegetables such as celery tend to concentrate more of the trace minerals in there. And then if you want to eat the leaves of the plants, like leafy greens, they could contain lots of different, you know, phytonutrients and lower deuterium content, as well as the roots of plants. Think like the carrot or the yucca, or cassava, or sweet potatoes, potatoes, 
which are tubers technically, eat the underground portions of the plants, eat the stem of the plants. You know, I eat the, the heart of palm, which is like the, the trunk of the plant, right? You can eat the seeds of the plants, nuts and seeds, you know, beans and grains, right? I want you guys to eat all parts of these plants because all the different parts of the plants have different kinds of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, polyphenols, antioxidants, all these things. And some people might just focus only on the fruit because they think fruit's God and we digest it the best so we don't need anything else. Man, if that's what you think, more power to you. I'm just telling you guys my personal beliefs based on me doing this for 28 years and looking up a lot of science and seeing the comparisons of the different nutrients and different parts of plants. I mean, even if you just grow rosemary, right? You think rosemary, oh yeah, rosemary all has the same nutrients. But man, there's studies on the, the, the young growth of the rosemary plants at the butt, at the tips have different nutrients than the, than the, the green stems, which then have different nutrients than the, the more woody stems and the older growth. It's insane how deep and complex it gets that I've looked into. So I just tell you guys, once again, eat all the different parts of the plants. Now, of course, the next thing as I'm sitting here in my garden and I'm growing all these edible flowers and beans and leafy greens this time of year, I got some kumquats on my tree. It's the only fruit I got right now because it's cold season. But how the food is grown that you choose to eat, you know, I will be focusing specifically on the plant foods, obviously, because I eat plants myself. And one of the considerations you may want to take into consideration is organic versus conventionally grown food. I know a lot of you guys really don't see the benefit in organic food. And conventional food is, you know, so much cheaper in many cases. Sometimes half is half is much expensive or, or, or maybe even more. Maybe sometimes if it's even less. I mean, I was at the grocery store today and bananas like organic bananas are 69 cents a pound, but non-organic bananas are 59 cents a pound. And tell me guys, come on, for 10 cents extra pound, wouldn't you guys spring for organic? Post it down below, let me know, man. For 10 cents extra pound, if organic produce was 10 cents extra pound, would you spring for it or not? I mean, I think that is personally a no-brainer. So you know how the food is grown can play a big role in its nutritional quality. Right. You know, so conventional fertilizers may add I don't know, maybe a half dozen different minerals into the soil to grow that plant. And when you guys look at the studies on conventionally grown food, you know, the mineral content of the leaves that are, are grown with the conventional fertilizers, you know, they have a lot of certain nutrients like nitrates, um, which could be good for nitric oxide production. But then they'll have low, you know, nutrients of more important trace minerals based on the data I've seen, right? In addition, because they're spoon feeding plants certain nutrients, it may grow nice and big, it may look lush, but it may not have the, the breadth or the depth of different kinds of phytochemicals and polyphenols than an organic plant could. So like literally you guys are ripping yourselves off if you guys are just buying conventional, you know, and not even considering organic. So I encourage you guys strongly to you start buying organic, you know, and look at the price differences, guys. If it's 10, 10 cents different a pound, man, you guys are worth it. You can afford that. You know, if it's double as much, then you might want to think about it and check your budget and stuff. For me, basically, I only buy it organic for most things. I have some exceptions where I will buy conventional produce if it is not available organic, such as like jackfruit. I can't buy that organic, and I could either not eat it or get it conventional. I'm just going to buy it conventional. Of course, if things on the clean 15 I might buy I might be buy those non-organic, but if it's on the dirty dozen, then I'm going to make sure I only buy those organic. So that's one factor. And let's not even talk about the pesticides that are existing on the conventional versus organic foods, right? Man-made pesticides or more natural pesticides, right? And I'm going to say that I'm going to go with the natural pesticides every single time. That being said, you should also wash your fruits and vegetables no matter what they are. Um, but yeah, the conventional produce you're buying may have additional neurotoxins. That, that's how they kill the bugs on the plants by neurotoxins for bugs, which may affect us. And, you know, it's the cumulative exposure that's really important. So I really want you guys to think about these things. You may not you know, feel it or see it now when you eat, you know, a conventional apple or something now, but accumulation of eating a lot of fruits and vegetables that are conventional, you know, down the road may give you some challenges later on, right? 
Another consideration is local versus industrial grown produce, right? While I do visit the produce terminal and buy industrially grown produce that's trucked in from outside the country and from big farms, you know, my preference is to shop at the local farms and local farmers markets to have higher quality, fresher picked foods. Local versus industrial is just another factor I want you guys to consider when figuring how the food is grown. Get to know your local farmers and ask them what fertilizers they use. How do they grow the food? Can I come visit your farm and see the growing process, right? If they have nothing to hide, they'll I'll, I'll invite you guys down there. And then I'm like, man, if farmers invite you guys down there, that's probably an honest farm because they're not trying to like hide anything from you, right? And I visit a lot of farms, so I know kind of what's going on. Another thing, of course, how it's grown is homegrown. Homegrown, in my opinion, is the best because I know exactly what was sprayed on my kale, exactly what was sprayed on this uh, ba pepper basil right here below, what was sprayed on my moringa tree, right? What was put onto my kumquats or my figs or my tree collards, right? I don't spray them with anything that's not organic, number one. And number two, I rarely even spray organic sprays these days. I just let nature work, work itself out and really work on building the soil and adding nutrients that even industrial farms, conventional farms, organic farms, and most local farms don't even add to the soil. So I know I can have the highest quality food because, you know, not only your diet, but how it's grown and, and what, what nutrients are put in the soil will make up the produce that you are eating. And, and these are very important things to consider that most people don't even consider, right? How fresh is, how, how freshly picked is it before you eat it, right? I pick my lettuce and I eat it right then and there in a salad. And then the last thing I want you guys to consider, and only if you get to know your farmer or you do it yourself will you be able to even ask this or know this, is what did your food eat? Yeah, I mean, if you still eat animal products, you want to know, did your, you know, did your cows eat grass on the free range or did they eat oats or hay or did they eat corn gmo and soy you know but even thinking about what do plants eat and you're scratching your head wait john how do plants eat they don't have mouths well plants can eat things from the roots even and even absorb nutrients from their leaves right so what are the plants eating so like i feed my plants compost organic matter you know some Farms feed their plants manure, right, from factory farms. And I know a lot of vegans out there might object to that, but, you know, that's what's happening in the real world. But you could put your fingers in your ears and not hear about it or put your head down and not want to know about it. But I think these things are important. You know, my goal is, is to not support even vegetable farms that use manure as their primary fertilizer input. And, you know, the big challenge, I'll tell you guys, that a lot of organic farms, the way they get nutrients into their farm are through the animal industry, you know, through the poop, through the manure, because it's like free or low cost and animal farms just want to get rid of it, right? There's other ways to grow organically. You could grow veganically, right, by not using any manures and by using mineral-based fertilizers and other organic matter. I compost all my fruits and vegetables and that makes up a good percentage of my soil here, but you know, most farms are not doing this because it's a lot more laborious, and not as cost effective. So yeah, and then besides what, what did the plants eat, right? I, I also add, add in specific things like worm castings, like rock dust, like insect frass, like humic acids, like different kinds of probiotic sprays for my plants, you know, like compost teas, so that they're eating a wide variety of different kinds of inputs, you know, our diet is only as good as of a diverse of an I input or diet we are eating. Likewise, the plants, or if you guys are still eating animals, their diets are only good as the diversity or lack thereof diversity that they're eating. So my goal these days is to feed my plants a big diverse and literally smorgasbord of different kinds of ingredients so that they can get all the different nutrients they need. And when they get all the nutrients they need, they are more resistant against disease and pests and bugs, but more importantly, they create higher quantities of the valuable plant phytonutrients that will end up feeding me. Things like polyphenols that could be, you know, significantly higher in something homegrown than something, you know, grown industrially. So yeah, that'll round it out. You know, I want you guys to pay attention to how your food is grown 
and, and, and dial this in. You know, here's the thing, guys. I've been doing this for 28 years. Like, on day one, I was not even aware about all these different things. I was just aware about the diet component, right? It took me about 10 years until even I got into the how it was grown component. You know, my friend Don Weaver enlightened me to the benefit of growing homegrown in rock dust. And that just was the tip of the iceberg. And then I just dove in head first and learned there's so many other things you could do besides rock dust to build the, the quality polyphenol content and trace minerals of the food you're growing you know of course the last thing we're going to talk about is how the food is processed which you know as somebody who got into raw foods back in 1995 this was at the top of my you know um, game and top of top of my awareness because you know that's one of the basis of the raw vegan diet is how is the food processed you know not only before you buy it but after you buy it as well so let's get into that right now. How is the food process, right? So what processes went to the food before you even bought it, right? So when was the produce picked and how fresh is it is one consideration, you know. Was the apples that you guys are buying now picked literally last fall and been in basically oxygen deprived cold storage for months until you buy it, right? That's not as fresh. That's not going to have as many nutrients as something that's fresh picked, and then you could just eat it, right? Or You know, that's why I grow a garden. I literally could pick things and eat it fresh right then and there. That's going to be always the best in my personal opinion. You know, and even so, like, what, what after it was picked, like, what post-harvest treatments did they do, right? Did they do this thing called hydro-cooling where they basically take cauliflower, pick it from the field, and put it into, like, literally an ice box, chill it down super fast to, quote-unquote, lock in the nutrients, what does that do to food? Most people never even consider this. I've looked into all these things, guys. And it's like, well, like hydro cooling can have some benefits to lock in nutrients so the food doesn't degrade faster, right? It could have some negative things as well because, you know, if the food isn't as fresh as it was, if you picked it yourself, right, it's going to lose nutrients. You know, did they pick the organic oats or non-organic oats and then spray it with glyphosate? as a ripening agent after they picked it. Now they, they could do that to non-organic oats. They shouldn't be doing it to organic oats, but yet organic oats have been shown to have some glyphosate contamination in there. So you might wanna look and get a certified glyphosate free organic oats if you are concerned about that. So I want you guys to pay attention to how is the food processed after it was harvested, right? I mean, before you buy it, right? And that's just one element that could get you going down a rabbit hole and get you all kind of crazy so i mean the easiest way to do that is grow your own or go to a farmer's market that you could visit the farm and ask them the process process that they do you know before you buy the food i mean raw foodists would know that a lot of just cashews that are labeled raw cashews in the store have been heat processed because that's how they're treated unless you get the special ones the special really raw ones from matt monarch the only guy that i know is still selling the really raw cashews they're quite hard to find if you really want the really raw ones. If that's really important to you, right? You're also going to pay about three times or four times more money for those really raw cashews just so that you can say, I'm raw. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, that, that can be definitely an important consideration. I try to eat as many things as possible raw, of course. Next, of course, is once you buy the food, how do you process it? What do you do to it, right? You could be on a carn carnivore diet and throw stuff on the grill. And if you guys are on a carnivore diet, which I would not personally do myself, and throw things on the grill over a fire with flame and you char broil your stuff and make it black, like, man, I'm going to say that's a very unhealthy carnivore diet because you're just turning your stuff black. You're creating toxins. Link down below my, my video I made just talking about cooked food toxins. And yes, I'm not going to say all cooked food is toxic, but most cooking methods that most people employ and use these days create toxins in the food. My goal is to minimize or even eliminate all the toxins created if I do choose to heat process my food. So you want to choose cooking methods to get the most benefits from the foods you eat. And at the same time, cooking can create toxins. So you want to minimize the toxins. So, you know, how can you cook things to get the most benefit yet minimize the toxins? So, I mean, the main things that come to mind are number one, cook for the shortest amount of time as possible and number two cook at the shortest and lowest temperature as possible okay and of course next raw can keep certain nutrients right 
that you that you won't keep when you heat process some foods including enzymes which can be important in things like brassica vegetables because they make the brassica vegetables more anti-cancer and more beneficial for us to eat and of course the best processing techniques are eat your foods raw if you they can be eaten raw right pick kale out of my garden eat it just pick the leaf and eat it instantly and chew it on up right that's one of the best ways to eat the foods, right? And make sure you chew it up properly into a mush so you get the best digestion. Of course, next, I would also recommend making a slow juice or using a slow juicer. My favorite juicer is the Nama J2 juicer. Link down below to my video. 10 reasons why the Nama J2 is my favorite juicer. Slow juicing will introduce the least amount of oxygen, yet grind up the food at a low and slow RPM to extract the most nutrients out of the juice so you guys could get the benefits. You know, we are not necessarily designed to properly digest greens as easy as we can fruit, although we can do it. But that's where I find juicing quite beneficial to break open the cell walls to get some of those nutrients out so that I could get a faster absorption and higher concentrations of those plant phytochemicals into me. Of course, after that, I would recommend something like vacuum blending. I do not and no longer recommend traditional blending in a Vitamix. I only recommend vacuum blending, which you can do with your Vitamix if you have a special attachment. Links down below to two videos I've made on that. I've also made other videos on this channel where I share with you guys, you know, clearance deals on vacuum blenders. I've had two now that have been around 40 or $50 because I just want you guys to get awareness about vacuum blending. Buy one so you guys could try it and you guys could truly see the difference it makes by not oxidizing your foods and adding excess oxygen and air into your blended smoothies which can and will cause extra bloating and gas and reduce some of the different nutrients and significantly reduce the storability and the flavor taste and color of the foods you're eating as well right i'm thankful for that i i did become a raw vegan you know 28 years ago now back in 1995 because it really acutely made me aware of how is the food processed and i you know, mistakenly thought back then that, you know, if it's cooked, it's bad. If it's raw, it's good. There's plenty of raw foods that you don't have to heat process that can be processed in other ways that you could really denature the foods and take its quality down quite a bit. One of those ways is actually dehydration, which I'm not a big fan of these days. I would rather personally rather cook in, you know, my pressure cooker, the instant pot and cook it at a, uh, you know, higher temperature like maybe 240 degrees for even just zero minutes on the instant pot then say dehydrate something you know for 24 hours for example if, if nutrients are really important to you right that's what I'm gonna say of course there's other techniques for drying I did mention this in my video with Kailash such as vacuum drying you know you could look into that that's a new technology that I believe is significantly better than the standard dehydration all right and of course, the last thing I want to mention is that we want to minimize the processing time. Whatever method of processing you guys are doing, whether it's traditional blending, vacuum blending, slow juicing, cooking, we want to try to minimally minimize the time that we are processing food. Minimize your cooking time. Minimize the time you're basically blending up something, right? In this way, you guys are going to keep more of the beneficial nutrients in the foods that you guys choose to eat, right? And so I'm confident that if you guys not only figure out, you know, the diet you're eating, but also, more importantly, how the food is grown, optimizing that, optimizing how it is processed, not only before you buy it, but also after you buy it. And of course, choosing the right foods, the foods that are more nutritious, more bang for their buck. You know, using these three things, you guys are going to have more of a complete system instead of just looking at diet alone so that you guys in the end could be a lot healthier. And, you know, I'm just sharing with you guys the information that I've learned over my 28 years that has taken me a while to condense down. And you're like saying, John, that video is too long. And I'm going to tell you guys, it took me years to learn all this stuff that I've condensed down into this a little bit longer video than most videos on YouTube. So I want to thank you guys for staying. And if you guys stayed to the end, hey, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. That'll help out the YouTube algorithm. Push this video out to more people so that they can be more aware of some of these extra added benefits of not only considering the diet you're on, but some of the other most important factors that will determine your health outcome in the end. Also, be sure to share this with other people on a plant-based raw vegan diet or any other diet so that they could improve their diet as well. These are things you're literally not going to hear on any other channel because, like, I didn't learn these from anybody. I came up with them 
on my own. <laughs> also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out on my new and upcoming episodes I have coming out about every five to seven days. You don't know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. And make sure you click the little bell to get invited as my new videos come out. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. The past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 700 episodes at this time. Teach you guys how to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables because they are always the best. Links down below some of the videos I've referenced in this episode as well as some others that I believe you guys might want to watch as well where I've done whiteboards and get into some of the nitty gritty things that you know you will not learn on other YouTube channels. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time and until then remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. <music>